My name is uh, Ryland Penta. I'm an events associate at the University Bookstore. Um, we're glad to have you here. We're always happy to entertain. Um, we do about 500 events a year, so we're always happy to see you coming back through these halls. Um, but tonight, we have Tom Rob Smith, the author of The Farm, which is right behind us if you're interested. Um, the University Bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in Washington State, and it's the largest on the west coast of the United States. Um, Tom Rob Smith, however, graduated from Cambridge in 2001 and lives in London. His first novel, Child 44, was a New York Times bestseller and an international publishing sensation. Uh, please help me welcoming Tom Rob Smith. Uh, hi there. Thanks for coming today. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about Child 44 and about the farm today. Um, I don't know what books you've read or haven't read, but Child 44 is my first book. And the reason I wanted to talk about it actually is because just recently I feel like the cycle of the whole thing has come complete. Which is to say I started writing Child 44 in 2006. I was, I think, 24 years old. I didn't have a book contract. I didn't have publisher. I didn't have any real connections, actually. Um, I just stumbled across the story. Um, I didn't even read much true crime originally. Um, but I was working on a screenplay by a short story writer called Jeff Noon, who's a science fiction writer in England. And this story was bought by a film company, and they wanted to adapt it. And it was about a future in which you could take a criminal and you could take the criminality out of their mind and release them back in society. So rather than having a prison, you would just process criminals and release them back in society. That was a concept for the book, fun concept. And you would have made a fun concept for a movie too. Now I knew nothing about true crime, so I thought I'm gonna research all this true crime to write this screenplay. And whilst researching it, I came across the case of Andre Chikatilo. I don't know whether you've heard of, heard of Andre Chikatilo. He is, what's interesting is he is one of the most notorious serial killers ever to have lived. Yet he's quite unknown as a, as, a, as a character. He murdered in Soviet Russia. He murdered in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And he killed about, they're not entirely sure, but the estimate is somewhere about 70 people. And the reason he killed so many people is not because he was this sort of criminal genius who could evade capture by stealth and by guile. He, in fact, was a very bad liar. He was caught at one point with a suitcase with a knife in it. And when asked by a police officer what he was doing, the only excuse he could come up with, hi, oh, yeah, join, join, join. <laughs> um, I'm just talking about Andre Chikatilo, who is the, uh, the, the real case that Child 44 is, is based on. And this killer was caught with a knife in his bag, and um, he was asked what he was, this, it, was a, it was a very unusual knife, very long, and he was asked what he was doing with it, and he said he had it just for cutting salami. I mean, it was the worst lie ever. And the reason they let him go is because he had a, a badge that said he was a member of the Communist Party. And if you remember the Communist Party, you were above suspicion. And they were convinced that this killer had to be rooted in the subversive element of society, people they didn't like. And that prejudice cost about 40 people lives. So that was, my, that was my impulse. I thought, I've got to tell this as a story. Now, the real case took place in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I decided to set it in the 50s. And I decided to fictionalize the main character, because the real detective struck me as incompetent. I mean, that's why he got away with so many killings. So I thought, let's make up a new detective. And let's have a hero who had been arresting many political prisoners and had been uh, richly rewarded for it because it was, he was a state police officer, a member of the secret police. And let's have that person try and redeem himself by trying to arrest one genuinely guilty person, but in so doing, criminalizes himself. That was the, the sort of neat nutshell behind the book. Anyway, I thought it was a cool idea, and I just started writing it without a book contract. And um, it was published, and, and, and it was optioned. And what's happened recently that sort of completed the cycle, obviously the book has been published now across all the countries and has been translated into, I think, 35 different languages. But what happened very recently is the movie happened, um, which was very exciting. And uh, I was criticized by some people who thought that I'd written this book in the hope of it being a movie. The truth is Hollywood makes very, very few movies about Stalinist Russia. Um, and outside of World War II, there are almost none. 
So the, uh, it's almost extraordinary that it's happened at all. And if you'd asked me two years ago whether I thought it would happen, I would have said probably not. Um, suddenly, the sort of magic dust came together in some strange way, and we had a director called Daniel Espinosa, who directed a movie called Safe House with Denzel Washington and Ryan Reynolds. That movie did very, very well, and he um, was suddenly loved by Hollywood. Uh, and he really wanted to do this book. They, he said, this is what I want to do. And then the cast, you need various elements for a movie to come together. And the elements started kind of coming together at the right time. We had um, Tom Hardy plays Leo. Um, Gary Oldman plays his partner. Uh, Nomi Rapace plays Raisa, his wife. And she was always, do you know Nomi Rapace? You know who she is? Yeah, from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo? The Swedish version. And from Ridley Scott's Prometheus. Um, she's a, I mean, she's really incredible. Um, I went on set last summer. They filmed it all in Prague because Prague has amazing locations that can double up as sort of ex-communist st structures. It has a great um, film crew and it's uh, much less corrupt than modern day Moscow in terms of having to bribe everyone to film. It's just a terrible place to film, uh, very tricky. So it was suitable in many different ways. And I visited um, I visited last July, it was very hot, and I remember uh, being very excited, you arrive at the airport, and as a writer of the book, I didn't write the screenplay, Richard Price wrote the screenplay, and I didn't really have very much to do actually with the production, I was a kind of, I don't know how to describe it, a sort of peripheral figure. Anyway, so I turn up at the airport and you're met by a, a, a lovely sort of driver who gives you a pack which says Child 44, sort of beginner's guide to the history. And um, you, uh, you, it's very, it's just fun to see it printed. I, I kept it. And so I went to the hotel and realized actually no one cared that I'd arrived. And I was sort of, <laughs> just sort of wandering around this very nice hotel. And then so I rang the producer and I was like, so I'm here, um, what do I do? So anyway, they then took me to this forest scene. And it's at night and they light it in the most extraordinary way. They have these giant, they're like mattresses, huge mattresses that are filled with helium or something. They float in the sky and they're full of light. And you see them from quite far away, these sort of, it's very surreal. Nothing like sort of, I don't know, you would imagine a sort of moody thriller. Um, anyway, so I turn up and the scene they're shooting, Tom Hardy and Nomi Rapace, they're on the train tracks, and this is the scene. Uh, Leo Demidov, the detective, has been exiled from, uh, from Moscow for disobeying rules. And he's in this sort of horrible town in the middle of nowhere. And he's decided to take on this investigation. And I remember very clearly writing this scene in my study in London, thinking, will this book even be published? And it's the scene where he's telling his wife, I've got to, I've got to try and solve these murders. And I remember thinking when I wrote it, I really hope the reader understands that what he's trying to say is, this is my attempt at salvation, this is my attempt at redemption. He's not just saying I need to solve the case. He's saying if I solve the case, maybe you can love me again, because I know you despise me for everything I've done. So that's the sort of subtext of the scene. I remember really, really struggling over this scene in kind of my, my, my study. So I get on set and I read the, the sort of, they give you the pages for the script. And I was, you know, the, the good dialogue. And I think, I hope this comes through. Anyway, so Tom Hardy walks up to Nomi Rapace. They're acting on, on, on um, these train tracks. And suddenly, middle of the scene, he bursts into tears. And every, you could feel the goosebumps on everyone's neck watching it. Because you realize this, I mean, I think he's slightly crazy as a person, but he's a brilliant actor. <laughs> and um, anyway, so you're watching it and think, wow, it's come to life. So not only had the movie happened, but it was happening in a really exciting way. Now, I actually told that story. A journalist came up to me at a book launch in London. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of a newspaper in England called the Daily Mail. Have you heard of the Daily Mail? Um, I have one rule when I talk to the press, which is I never say anything negative. I just, you know, if I haven't enjoyed something, I just won't mention it. I just think it's a much safer way to go. So I only tell positive stories. Um, and uh, that's my, I, I thought that would serve me very well as a, as a rule. Uh, it seems I need a second rule, which is never tell the Daily Mail anything. Um, <laughs> because I told the Daily Mail that exact story that I just told you, thinking, well, I can't go wrong with that story. It's a great story. How what an amazing experience it was as a writer to see your scene enacted. And what an amazing actor Tom Hardy and Nomi Rapace are. It got published as Tom Hardy is a crybaby. Uh, 
And then it said in the article, novelist Tom Smith has let, has let slip that Tom Hardy burst into tears on set, as though he was sort of walking around randomly. And then quickly it added in a, acting in a scene, and then carried on about how... And I read it and thought, how is it possible that you've taken something? I mean, they have a kind of magic skill about able, a, being able to turn this into... Anyway, so I, you, know, you read it and think, okay, so I, even when as I tell that story, I'm now like, it's a good story. Please don't think badly of me. I had to sort of double check. But that was, that was the sort of the genesis of, of, of seeing it from book to film. Uh, and now sort of that, that journey is almost complete. I get to watch the movie when I come to LA in July. So I haven't yet seen it. I've just sort of seen the stuff I've seen on set. So yeah, it's very exciting. Now, in a sense, what's interesting about comparing Child 44 to the new book, The Farm, is that you, I told you about the origins for Child 44 for, which is me stumbling across the real case. Now, I think as a writer, when you come to assess stories, um, you have to decide why it is you want to tell this story. And if you're telling a story about a world that's very far removed from your own life, such as Soviet Russia, I'm clearly, I didn't live in Soviet Russia, I mean, I visited, but you know, just as, in a sense as a tourist, how do you make that world feel personal and connected? And I think you have to sort of pour yourself into it in some way. Now, with the farm, I'm drawing from a very different uh, experience. Now, I had never thought I would write something autobiographical because I'm a thriller writer. And the truth is, my life is relatively safe and uh, sedate uh, and, I guess, ordinary in some ways. You know, I mean, I haven't, I never really felt any terrible jeopardy or I just couldn't imagine writing it, uh, writing a thriller drawn from it. I wouldn't know what it would be. And I was writing agents, and you know, this I thought would be true for the rest of my, I hope to have been true, I guess, for the rest of my life. And I was writing Agent Six, and my parents, um, so my mother is Swedish, my dad is English. Um, I grew up in England, but my, I went back to Sweden regularly with my mum, although she lived in London, obviously, as well. Now, my parents, once they had decided to retire, didn't want to live in London anymore. It's very expensive. I think it's just a place of quite a lot of stress. It's quite a worky place. And so they sold their house in London and then bought this farm in a remote part of Sweden. And they had lived there for two years. It's a very beautiful farm. I'd visited several times. And it was this idea of a retirement as a kind of, I don't know, change of life, which is you grow your own food, you live a slower pace, you don't spend as much money, you don't need as much money, that kind of retirement. Anyway, I was running Agent 6, and I got a call from my dad, and he said, uh, he was crying, actually, and my dad never cries in a kind of British, stiff upper lip way. I think he'd cried once before, I'd heard him cry once before in my life. And so I, I immediately stopped walking, and I'm like, Dad, what's, what's wrong? He says, your mum's very ill, she's in a mental hospital in Sweden. Now, this came completely out of the blue. I didn't know that anything was happening with my parents. Um, but he said, you need to book a flight to Sweden, obviously, to come out and see her. So I went back to my apartment, and um, uh, I booked that flight, and also tried to do some research. Because I, you know, I don't know, I don't know anything about your lives, but certainly from my point of view, I knew about mental health only from books and movies, really. I knew nothing in terms of up close. So the notion of a psychosis, which is what my dad told my mom was suffering from, I didn't even really have a grip on what that meant. So I remember doing some research online. It was a very strange period. Anyway, I was on my way to the airport when I get another call. And this time it's from my mother. And she's left the hospital. And she uh, tells me that everything my father has told me is a lie. She's not mad. He is using allegations of insanity to cover up a criminal conspiracy that he's involved in. She is telling me that she, is, she left the hospital because she convinced the doctors that she's fine, which proves that she's telling the truth because she obviously had left the hospital. She was on a payphone. And she said she was going to fly to England to tell me the truth. So, and then she hangs up the phone. So I have to rip up my ticket to Sweden and wait for her at Heathrow Airport. And she arrives and she's lost quite a bit of weight. Um, but she looks otherwise exactly the same, neatly dressed, um, looks like my mum. You know, we hug as everyone's hugging at the airport on the arrivals. And she says, I don't want to tell you what's going going on here. Take me back to your apartment and I will tell you the events of this, this past couple of months. So we went back to my apartment and we spent about four hours in conversation. In fact, in conversation is wrong because that night she was this 
she had a kind of incredible energy. Um, she was telling a story and I was really just a listener. It wasn't a conversation in a normal sense. And she wasn't talking in any, in any regular sense. She was talking with incredible animation. And, and the truth is actually she was talking in quite a brilliant fashion. I was totally spellbound for four hours. And I had presumed that as soon as she started speaking, it would be obvious whether she was ill or whether she was not. And the truth is, for those four hours, I didn't know. And fundamentally, the question was, could I believe my dad capable of doing something terrible? And the truth is, it's this cliche of thrillers that, or even if you watch news footage of when something terrible happens, the relatives are always on TV saying, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. And the truth is, we don't know. There are sides to people that are always elude us. There are sides to people that are dark and secret. And fundamentally, I was sitting there listening to my mom thinking, do I believe that my dad was capable of this? Do I believe that it's capable not to know a person completely? And so that was the concept for the film. That was the idea. I wanted to try and recreate for the reader this moment of uncertainty. Do you believe the father or do you believe the mother? And Yes, I'm a thriller writer, but I haven't taken this experience and sort of twisted it into the thriller world because that night, the tension I felt listening to my mom was really extraordinary. I mean, she was telling me a thriller story. It was all about betrayal and mistrust. It was all about jeopardy and fear. Um, and sitting down to write the book, I realized when I was reading other books about mental health that they often read in quite a formal way. They're quite academic and they follow a very similar structure, which is a relative will have a, uh, a partner or a child who suffers from an illness and they'll go to a hospital and they'll have treatment and the treatment will be successful or not successful. They follow this route like this. And the feeling of reading it is of factually being interested, but being quite distant from it. And I wanted to create a story where you feel the same tension that I felt that night. And that is at the, the heart of this book. Now, as soon as you start trying to write something that is based on truth, fiction, I mean, quickly takes over. For example, I knew the farm very well that my parents lived on. I've been there many times. And I knew all the people she was talking about. So she spoke to me that night in a kind of shorthand. And actually what I wanted was that clearly doesn't work for you because none of you had been to the farm. So we needed two different characters. We needed a mother and a son who were estranged on some level, um, a son who hadn't seen the farm. So the mother is telling the, is telling the son about this farm for the first time. And I'm going to read you a short extract where the mother, is, um, the mother is trying to explain the nature of this farm to the son. Now, in this story, the mother is trying to say, everyone will be telling you that this world was ordinary and beautiful and it makes no sense for me to be animated and, and agitated about it. But this landscape works in two different ways. Where there is beauty, there is also darkness. And these forests in Sweden, they're very different to um, landscape that, I, I don't know whether you know, English countryside can seem quite safe and, and small. Whereas in Sweden, the landscape is enormous. I mean, there are only 8 million people in Sweden and the country is, is huge. So there's a sense of epic scale. I mean, you can go into this forest and not come out for days and days. And so there are hints of darkness and danger. And so in, in everything in this book works on two ways. Is it innocent or is it guilty? Is it dark or is it, is it light? And so here is a passage where she's trying to explain that this farm, far from being the, the idyllic place that um, the son thinks it is, is actually a place that he should fear. So this is the mother talking to the son. Now, this isn't really conversation, remember. This is rhetoric. This is the mother trying to convince the son of her own sanity and of these allegations against, her father being tr against his father being true. It is a pity that you never had a chance to visit. My task today would have been easier if you'd experienced the farm firsthand. Maybe with these photos you consider a description of the landscape unnecessary. That's exactly what my enemies hope you'll think because they portray the countryside as being no different from the tourist brochure stereotype of rural Sweden. They want you to conclude that anything other than an enthusiastic reaction is so bizarre that it could only be the product of sickness and paranoia. Be warned, 
they have a vested interest in presenting it as picturesque, since beauty is easily mistaken for innocence. Standing at the point where these photographs were taken, you're immersed in the most unbelievable quiet. It's like being at the bottom of the sea, except instead of a rusted shipwreck, there's an ancient farmhouse. Even the thoughts in my head sounded loud, and sometimes I found my heart beating hard for no reason except as a reaction against the silence. You can't appreciate it from the photographs, but the thatched roof was alive, a living entity spotted with moss and small flowers, home to insects and birds, a fairy tale roof in a fairy tale setting. And I use the word carefully, for fairy tales are full of danger and darkness, as well as wonder and light. The exterior of this ancient property hadn't been altered since its construction 200 years ago. The only evidence of the modern world was a collection of red dots in the distance, beady rat eyes atop wind turbines, barely visible in the gloom, churning a morbid April sky. And here's the crucial point. As the fact of isolation sinks into our consciousness, we change, not at first, but slowly, gradually, until we accept it as the norm, living day to day without the presence of the state, without the outside world chafing against our side, reminding us of our duty to each other. No passing strangers or nearby neighbours, no one peering over our shoulder, a permanent state of unwatched. It alters our notion of how we should behave, of what is acceptable, and most important of all, what we can get away with. So in that extract, you can see the mother is trying to convince the son of the danger of this landscape. And in a sense, all the way through, what interests me about um, the mother as this narrator is that she's very close to the role of an author. As an author, I'm concerned all the time with what you believe. Do you believe what I'm presenting to be true? That's first and foremost at the center of my mind. I'm sitting there crippling these words together thinking, I really hope the reader believes them, because fundamentally they are just words on a page that you connect, that they connect to the truth. Now that night, my mum, my mum who was um, suffering a psychosis, was concerned with exactly the same things. And that's what interests me. And that night, we came together, both mother and son, and we were both, in a sense, writers. I was a writer, in a sense, that was my profession. But she was also operating in a way as a writer, trying to convince me of these allegations. Now, um, I'm sure this will be asked if if I didn't answer it or what happened in in, in reality. The truth is, by the end of that night, I I still wasn't sure. And I thought the only sensible thing to do would be to at least go to a doctor in England because I knew that this doctor in England would be far removed from whatever could have happened or might have happened in Sweden. So surely that this doctor in England would be objective and they could, they could make the decision. And so I, I took my mum to the hospital and the doctor said she was ill and therefore she went into an asylum in England for about three weeks and started making a recovery very quickly and came out and has made a full recovery, which I think is the reason this book could be written because it's drawing from really a story of hope. But what's interesting, and I never thought about this at the time, but this has been asked to me during the tour and also during interviews is why my mum went with me to the hospital. Why didn't she, um, why didn't she not go? Why didn't she either leave me or why didn't she protest? And I don't know why I never asked the question, or I don't know, I don't know why at the time I never thought about it, but I asked my mum that um, recently, and she said the reason she went with me to the hospital, it didn't even cross her mind that I wouldn't believe her. She was so sure of the fact that I would believe her. The, only, the moment it occurred to her that I hadn't believed her is when the doctor said, well, you now have to come with me. And my mum has never really asked anything of me. Um, you know, she's done so much for me. Um, and that night she asked one thing, which was to believe her. And it was the one thing that night I couldn't do. So I sort of see this book in some ways as, as addressing that fact that I didn't do the obvious thing that night. And there's no acknowledgments in this book because the way I see it is that the whole book in a sense is an acknowledgement of, of our relationship. And even though we were never estranged, we had started drifting, my mum and I, as, uh, as people. I guess in a way that you do as when you're in your 20s and your, your parents go off. And, you know, you have separate lives in a sense. 
And that night brought us back together in a way that we were, you know, my mum used to always read, it, to read to me as a child. And that night she became this mother who was telling me a story again. And I was the son listening. And so in a strange way, yes, it was a night of, of trauma, but I look back on it and with, with some degree of affection. And I hope that is captured in the book. In the book, by the way, um, it is not clear whether the mother is, is, is mad or not. You have to decide that for yourself. I mean, that's part of the, 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 the game of the book. Um, so it's not giving anything away, telling you the real story. Um, and uh, really that's it. I think that, that tees up the book nicely. I hope you um, enjoy it if you haven't read it already. Um, I hope you have enjoyed it if you have read it. And I'm happy to take questions now if there are any questions. Has your mother read the book yet? Yeah, my mother actually has read, read all the drafts. So she was involved in, I wouldn't say it was the editing process, but she was involved uh, in terms of uh, I guess the emotional process of publishing it. Like she knew before I wrote the book that I was going to write the book. And actually that was the hardest stage because I think at that stage she was like, well, what is it going to be? She couldn't even have imagined it. And then she read it and realized this is all made up. So she was kind of like, I mean, you take that central concept of what happened that night and then you have to, you know, you have to create this narrative in a way of trying to give the reader the sensation I had, which was of that tension. So all of the characters in the book are, are a fiction. And once I think she settled into the, the, the fictionality, if that is a word, of, of the novel, she was very comfortable with it. And then the fact she's done promotional um, events in England, we did an interview together, and she came to the launch party. Yeah. I think you know, she's made a full recovery and you know, people get ill and, they get, and sometimes they get better. And I think um, I, it's curious, though, this notion of uh, stigma around mental health, which is uh, perplexing to me since, you know, as I said, people get ill and they get better. What about your father um, in all of this? The, the truth, the untruth, the light, the dark, uh, your relationship with him? What you mean? It, yeah. Um, yeah. So the question was, um, what about my father in the real life version? But in some ways in the book too, because the father is, is a slightly absent figure in the book, because this is a world being told to us by the mother. Now it's always the case if someone is telling a story that you're only getting a partial fragment of the character they're talking about. And certainly that was true in reality as well because my dad was I mean the strange thing with my dad was he gave me that phone I received that phone call from him, the, the first phone call and then we had the plan to go to Sweden and then we had my mum coming out of the asylum now I phoned my dad with that news and he did at that point react quite strangely which is he seemed kind of numb and I remember him going to the airport to try and intercept her and I remember him being on the phone I remember listening to their conversation when they kind of met and it was a very strange conversation. He sounded almost annoyed. And I remember thinking, why does he sound annoyed if she's ill? I don't get what's going on here. And then he said to me, I'm not following her to England, which I didn't understand either. I was like, I don't get any, any of what's going on. Part of that is played into my sense of, I don't understand his reactions, which meant that I therefore it opened this gap, this space, where I was filling it with possibilities. Now the truth is, he was just exhausted. I think he was in a state of shock that she had left the hospital, having thought that she would be secure. Um, and I think he was, um, I think he was just, he wasn't quite thinking straight. And he then came, I mean, he then took the next flight the next day. But that gave me, in a sense, this space on my own with my mother. So in many ways, he's a kind of missing, he's a missing figure, and he, that, is part of the structure of the book, which is you have to try and work out who this absent person is. Is he someone dangerous or is he someone who just loved her? You know, you have to decide. And that absence kind of helps because in a sense you're creating who the father is in your mind, you're deciding. That process of decision-making is yours to make, as it was that night for me. Um, I think it's a tricky one. I certainly don't think there were any sort of, nothing like a psychosis. I mean, it's hard to know, isn't it, whether, whether someone has issues that are undiagnosed and which are complicated. Could it be the farm has a dark side? 
or the actual fun. Well, I tell you what I do think. I do think that um, space and time are psychologically quite tough, which is to say if you're, you lead a very busy life living in a city and you've brought up three children and you have a mortgage and a job and all that kind of stuff, you have very little free time. Suddenly you decide I'm exhausted with all of it and you move to this farm which is in a remote location and you have an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of space. Now issues that you have in, in your mind have the room to start developing, I think. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a doctor, I don't have any answers, but I think actually we can idealize that sort of world. And I think actually there's a real stamina and toughness about living in that space that is quite tricky. And certainly with, it's a very generalized perspective. I don't really know what happened with my mum. And my mum doesn't really know, I think, necessarily what happened. Um, and in the book, I kind of give, I give everything a shape. And in a, in a sense, in reality, it didn't quite have the shape that I think a reader wants. So the question you, you, you ask is, is one I think as a fiction writer, I had to address. Whereas in reality, I, I don't quite have the answer. But, yeah. My question is sort of related to that, which is that you pulled the story from uh, real life experience and, and developed it sort of organically. But then it comes to the means of its telling. And the structure that you provide this particular story um, could not have occurred by happenstance. It seems as though it, it evolved very intentionally to kind of create these layers and, and the plot of it. I'm wondering if those are if those are separate tracks that are going on, how I'm going to tell the story as well as the content or the subject matter at the same time, because you've been praised in all of your books for, for strengths in both those areas. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because one of the things I loved about writing the book is having written a trilogy, the big, um, in a sense, the big pleasure of writing a trilogy is taking these characters that you really care about and doing this huge story, um, taking a family and setting it across three periods of Soviet Russia. I think the downside is that you have to follow the narrative um, and the narrative shape that you set in the first book. You can't suddenly write a first-person narrative from Leo's point of view if you've written it third-person. It just would be very odd, I think. I mean, there's not there's a rule about it, but I think there has to be some sort of narrative consistency. Now, with The Farm, I remember sitting down and thinking, I know I want to tell this story, but the truth is I have no idea how to tell it. And it's a really, I found it a very invigorating feeling to wake up in the morning and think, I need to figure out how this is going to work. Now, in the first draft, actually, it's almost just the mother speaking. I mean, she speaks and she tells her story. And I thought, I'm not really interested in the character of the son, which was, in a sense, me. I was like, that, because that character is meant to be you, the reader, anyway. You're the person who's making, meant to be making judge, judgments. So this person doesn't really need to be there. The problem is, when you read that draft, you kept asking these questions like, what's the son doing? What's the son thinking? So rather than this absence, in a sense, freeing up your experience, it started to sort of slow it down a bit because you were asking all these questions and it was kind of like a missing part. So then you wanted to know who this person was that was listening. And then at that point you needed to know, well, how did the stories bump into each other? How did his story bump into her story? So his voice developed um, alongside that. And then you, in a sense, had two different first-person narratives because he is in a very traditional first-person narrative. The son is telling us what's happened and he's writing, this is my experience, this is how it works. The mother has no concept of this being turned into text. The mother is just speaking directly to you. So I wanted to have her first person narrative feel like raw dialogue, like it's just been ripped out of the air. Now it's not raw dialogue like regular speech, like when you go into a shop, because she's performing, she's telling a story. So it's very different to sort of regularized speech. But it's still just, it's meant to be yanked from the air and put down on the page. Um, so they're very two, two very different first-person narratives, and then they're sort of side by side. So that's sort of how it developed. But yes, you're right. I think that those two things were, those two tracks, in a sense, were both very important. There was the story itself, um, and there was the means of telling it. And there are other challenges. For how do you then break up this four-hour monologue, in a sense? And there are elements of, you know, she has all this evidence she's presenting. 
and some of the evidence is a diary that comes from the past. And so suddenly you can you can you can structure this this enormous amount of material in, in quite an interesting way. But yeah, there were there were those challenges. I'm struck too by the fact that with regard to Child 44, there's a piece of history that intrigued you enough. You thought, I think I'll just start writing a book. No one's going to pay me to do this, but I'm, I'm going to begin and uh, and create a piece of literary art. I'm wondering when in that process you not only believe you had a good story to tell, but a truly extraordinary book that it became. What, Charm 44? Yes. Uh, I mean, well, well, I have to say that even when I finished it, I didn't know it would even be published. So I was, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to be modest or, or humble. I mean, because it's, I think there's a strange balance with a writer of extraordinary arrogance, which is to say, why do I think that anyone in the world is going to spend not money, but their time reading anything I have to say? You have to have a certain amount of arrogance to think that you can do, you can pull it off. On the other hand, if you, if you just have that, then you're not going to have the ability to critique your own work and, and realize what isn't working, what is working. Now, I knew from the very beginning the story was great. I knew that was, because I could just feel, you can just feel that's a great story. It was a, such an interesting piece of history. But you can't sell it off the history, because the truth is the history books are better at telling the history than a, a fiction writer. That's a, you're doing a very different job as a fiction writer. So I think it started to, I started to really feel into it when um, I started to love the characters. You know? And then once you start to think, wow, I start to know how they think. I start to know when they come up against a situation what their decision would be. And I always loved them as a couple. I loved this idea of a, of a man um, thinking his wife loves him and then discovering that she despises everything he stands for. I thought that was a great romance. And then trying to win her over at that point was, was just an interesting journey to me. And I loved a, a, a wife who, um, you know, who then the, the flip side is she looks at him and thinks I despise him and despise And then she realizes, my God, there was something underneath all this that actually I can love. I mean, so, so that was, you know, th those things you start kind of falling in love with. And that's when you start getting excited, I guess. But um, the truth is, even when I finished it, I went off and uh, I think it took two weeks before we got heard back from a publisher. And I was very, very sure that it wasn't going to be published. I was working on something else. I was thinking, I was waiting for the rejections to come in. In fact, I even got told by my agent, oh, no one's bought it yet, but you've made some fans, which to me is the kiss of death as a comment. <laughs> I mean, I was like, you know, what? There couldn't be anything. I remember walking down the street thinking, oh, no, fans. <laughs> So, you know, it, you just don't know. It's hard to see how things land in the world. Um, so it was, it was a surprise. But as the accolades rolled in over time, it, it's, it would appear as though you began to believe that um, others enjoyed it as much as you did. Yeah, I mean, you meet people who have enjoyed it. I mean, I, I, weirdly, uh, the accolades are always, uh, you're, uh, they're a funny thing. Um, I think what actually it's about is some really great messages and emails from people. And no one needs to write those to you. There's no impetus to it. Um, ignore online reviews, because they're such a funny kettle. Of, but I'm talking about just an email someone sends you. No one has to spend however long they've spent it saying, you know, I, I don't know, like a kid who says, I don't read very much, but I read your book and I really, really loved it. I just wanted to let you know. He didn't have to, or she didn't have to send that message. And so you, they have a real, and you read that and you think, wow, that's, that's why I did it. Um, so those certainly are the, are the sort of the key sort of you know, then you really start feeling like it's, it's connected and also the book has now you know has came out uh, in 2008 and people still message me about it that song long so I knew it wasn't just sort of a burst of publicity it was there's, a, there's something that's connecting with people and that is very special because um, you know as much as I would like to say I just wrote it for the sake of it, I wrote it because I hoped it would connect. I mean, that's one of the things I love about reading, the way it which connects to people around the world. I think it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing part of, of reading and writing. When you uh, began Secret Agent, was it your intention to uh, make this trilogy then, or did, was the idea for the trilogy uh, sometime before you had completed Child Court 4? No, when I wrote Child 44, I didn't even know if it would get published. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I mean, I, what I happened was when it, when it was Child 44 was published, I then thought there's a really rare opportunity here. You've got this family, and you can set this family's um, life story against these three bits of history. 
So you have Stalinist Russia, you have Khrushchev, and then you have um, the sort of end of the regime. So I just saw the possibility of mapping out in a way that's unusual because normally it would be very artificial to sort of set the, their life stories against such different periods. It's just that the communist regime was so telescoped. It just sort of is sort of 80 years. It fits, it fits quite well with the life cycle. And that's when it sort of took off as, as an idea. And I knew that there would, there would be very different stories. Like, I mean, Khrushchev is so different to Stalin. And then that sort of the Afghanistan war is really a period of decay in that regime and, and about things coming to an end. So it, it felt like a natural way of ending off their story. So that's how it evolved. Uh, one of the things that struck me when I read your first three books was the, uh, what appeared to be the strength of your distaste for the Soviet regime. Uh, it was, I grew up with my with a father that was uh, the best red is dead and you know had nothing good to say about anything socialist and communist, etc. And please don't you know be offended, but I got a little bit of that feeling from your book. And I was kind of curious if uh, you had had you said that you had only visited the uh, Soviet Union. I was curious in your background if there was anything to establish this. I mean, I mean, Stalin, I would say. I, I mean, dictatorships have a strange relationship with them in the sense that I find them completely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And what I find fascinating about them is the way in which they try to reshape reality according to whatever ideologies they have, whether it be fascism, whatever it is. And they try and say black is white and white is black. And in a weird way, dictators act as writers. And dictators are often fascinated with writers because they think writers fabricate the truth. The truth is writers try and follow the truth. We don't try and manufacture it. We try and capture it on some level and we might fail or succeed. I think dictators think writers write something and it becomes true um, by the fact of it being written. And that's the way they see their power. I will say something and it will become true. And if it's backed up with a gun, then actually it does become kind of true. Um, so I'm interested, I guess, on a conceptual level from that point of view. I'm also interested in the way in which people behave in them. So it became fascinating on many levels. But in terms of how I see them, I mean, I think they're brutal regimes. I have no, I have no, I have no real, I mean, the, 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 you get into a, a situation of what is the reality of this regime versus the ideology? And I've become someone who really judges things on the reality. I'm not really, I mean, they can say whatever they like about whatever utopia they're trying to build. The reality is all these people were dying and starving, and that is the reality. Um, um, so I guess that's, that's what it comes down to. I guess, I do, you know, there, were, there are so many injustices, so much death, so much contempt for human life that, I do think uh, if you write a book as a, as, a, as a fiction writer compared to, say, as a historian, I do think some emotion needs to burn in you. And I did certainly very strongly uh, a sort of real contempt for what they did. That's definitely true. But it doesn't come from any, I don't know, I don't remember feeling some terrible burn as a child, particularly. I just more, the more I read, the more outraged I was. Like, for example, the famines where Child 44 started, I didn't know anything about those, really. I just couldn't believe that many people had died, and I couldn't believe how systematic it was, and I couldn't believe how de deliberate it was. So these revelations, you know, to start, they, the energy of them is, is channeled into the book. As, a, as an author who's both a novelist and a screenwriter, when Child 44 was optioned, Someone else was going to enjoy the task of turning it into a screenplay. Was there any conflict, any tension, any any difficulty in giving that up to somebody else? There wasn't at the time because it was Ridley Scott was the director. I mean, I thought they, they got on Richard Price as the writer. It was so exciting, such a great team. You were just like, wow, what are they going to do with it? Um, and also, I just spent two and a half years on it. I felt kind of tired in that sense. So, you know, to take a book, to break it apart and reassemble it as a movie takes a new burst of energy. And you have to feel it very strongly. And I don't think I did at that time. Um, I think if it hadn't got made and, you know, in five years' time, maybe I could have done it. Um, so, but there is, you're right, I mean, there is a sense of, oh, could you do it? Um, and I remember there was at one stage in the various drafts, I mean, there were so many cycles with this, this project 
um, as there are with every project. You know, different actors attached, different people demanding different changes. At one point, they took out the famines from the opening of the book. And that was the only point where I thought, how can they possibly take out the famines from this book? I just remember absolutely being appalled by it. And luckily, they, I don't know who gave that note, but they came back in again. Uh, and so then I was like, phew. And the stuff I saw on, on, when I went and visited uh, the set were, were, the scenes were brilliant and the script is great. So now I've been very lucky in that sense. I think if it had been, you know, you'd read the script and you hadn't liked it, it would have been, then you would have really felt that pain, I think. But um, I had, a, a, you know, a great team. London Spy is a, a miniseries that I've written for the BBC, which actually is going to get an American distributor too, which is great, so coming here. Uh, and it is, in many ways, it's like a novel, except the first, it's a first-person narrative novel. It's this one character in it where, um, who's almost in every single scene. And the reason it's not a novel is because he's just not a literate character. He's someone who I just couldn't imagine what his voice would be. So it's much easier to use the medium of television to tell that kind of story. And it's a thriller, it's contemporary. Um, in London, there is a sort of geographical fluke. I don't know how well you guys know London, but there's uh, the MI5, not MI5, MI6 building, which is famous in the James Bond movies now, the sort of modern one. that You see it in the, in the new Bond film, it blows up. Anyway, it's there by the river. They always shoot it from this side. Um, but on this side, there's a, you can see, here's the building, there's the river, River Thames. Here is a quite a big road. And on this side here, under the train tracks, Vauxhall, this, is, this area is Vauxhall, called Vauxhall. And under the train tracks are these clubs, and it's like this epicenter, oh, here is the promised. Uh, and on this side so the, are these clubs, and they are the sort of epicenter of hardcore clubbing in London. And I imagine taking a character from this world and having them fall in love with a character, a sort of hedonistic character who's slightly lost um, adrift in London, a character from this world, having them fall in love. And then when the spy is murdered, you have the lover taking on the investigation, except the lover is the most ill-equipped person to take on the codified, complex world of, 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 of the, the John le Carre-esque spy thriller. And so it's like a collision of old school thriller with this new contemporary character. And it's just a really interesting... I mean, the whole way the British spy world works is so interesting. It's all about signals and codes. And, and I don't mean that in terms of codes as in codes. I mean, tailoring and education and background and which school you went to, how you speak. And this is someone who is raw. This is someone who left school at 16, who's been, who's, who has no real education to speak. Can this person crack this world? That was, that was the challenge for me. And that's what, this, that's what the show is about. But, yeah. Has filming started? Uh, no, not yet. No, no we're in a pre-production stage. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it is exciting, yeah. Also on your website, uh, you had this cool little film um, for Agent Six, I think. For the farm, you mean? Was it for the farm? The if it's was cool, it was for the farm. Because <laughs> if it was not cool, it's for Agent Six. <laughs> well, it was like, it was like uh, 45 seconds long or something like that. I down think. The, down in the lower, lower right hand corner. And it was professionally done. I was looking at it going, is this Yeah, that's the see? farm. Oh, that's the farm. Yeah, the farm. <laughs> sorry. I, I got confused because I was like, yeah, this is really cool. Yeah, and no, then my friend, who's a director, I got him to do it. Because yeah. book trailers are a funny thing. Um, they just started doing them. And um, they're hard because the budget is very, very small. Um, you tend to employ a professional book trailer company that does many, 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 and uses lots of stock footage. And they, I don't know, they're, just, they're very difficult to do. They're getting better. But I thought, why not pull in some favors? I know this guy. He's really, really talented. He loves the book. Let's see what he does with it. And he did that. Yeah. I mean, he is a brilliant, brilliant director. So, um, yeah, that, that's how that came about. Yeah, I've never seen one of those before. Any yeah, they, they, website, yeah no, they just, they've just started doing them. Actually, a couple of years ago, they just started doing them. But I thought, let's try and do it, do it well. Mm. That's cool. Any, that's it. 
Well, thank you all for coming. You've been a lovely audience. I know it's been a nice evening, so it's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, I'm happy to sign any books or answer any questions if you didn't want to answer them, ask them publicly. But uh, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure.